simple steps. But if you just concentrate on that next step, that's all you have to do. The summit's up there in the back of your mind, inspiring you, of course, to do the job, but that's not where you concentrate on, it's the next step. And so if you come across a, a difficult part of a trip, the challenge is to find a way through that. But don't give up, you know, never give up. It's, it's, there's nothing um, more demoralizing than giving up. Yeah, that's, that's a good question too, because it's actually quite hard to keep yourself motivated. There are times when you're sick, when things aren't going so well, where you, you know, you're a long way from home, you get homesick, you know, all you want to do is just go home, get out of there, you know, and um, so, and you would do that, you would give up, if it wasn't for the fact that you were inspired in the first place to go and do this thing. That's the important thing, you've got to be inspired. If you're not inspired, you're really pushing a proverbial shit uphill, you know, it's just, it's just, um, you've got to be inspired in the first place, and if you are inspired in the first place, you find yourself naturally dreaming about what you're going to be doing. So it's getting that spark of enthusiasm, of excitement. And if you're finding something hard, something that you you know you want to do or someone else wants you to do, you've got to have a hard think about it. Do you really want to do it? If you decide yes, you really do want to do it, then you must get enthusiastic about it. If you don't, then you're wasting your life. It was good that we were a pretty disparate group of people, we were very different characters. But on other climbs and on this climb, we'd learnt um, what each other's strengths and weaknesses were and we learned how to get on well with each other and there was a really good sort of team atmosphere and that was critical to even getting this far. It's very, very important. If you don't have a good team feeling where you can, you know, one of trust, one of mutual acceptance and um, one of, I guess, just feeling good amongst yourselves, then uh, you're making it very, very difficult. In fact, doing something like this is probably nearly impossible to, to succeed. And at times like this is when tensions build up. This is when you know, it's equally important to know each other really well. Waiting for the right conditions is, is critical. And that's where patience comes in. You really got to play your, play your cards absolutely right, otherwise you'll blow it. You only get one chance at it, climbing the mountain, this sort of style. Uh, you don't have enough energy left in you to, to give it two goes. But this, the climb of this mountain was really pivotal in us being, not only having the, the confidence, but also having the, the the psychological, I suppose, background momentum to go and attempt Everest confidently. We were confined to our snow cave and gradually our food was running lower and lower and our fuel. And eventually on the sixth night we said, okay, if it's not clear in the morning, we're out of here. You know, otherwise we'll be dead. We can't wait any longer, we run out of food. Well, the next morning dawned clear and still. So <laughs> we went for it but we didn't get to the summit. We got about halfway up, and this is the best we could do to find a spot to spend the night. There was a bit of snow being blown into the back of a chimney, just enough for us to dig two ledges out of. There's only four of us now at this stage of the climb. There's Greg Mortimer, Andy Henderson, Lincoln Hall, and myself. And well, we said, had a, well, considering the circumstances, we didn't have a bad night. Um, you know, you have to cook your dinner holding the stove on your, on your lap. And I remember being woken by my hands being burnt as, as I'd fallen asleep, the stove sort of tilted over and it burnt my hand, so it was a good system, really. Um, <laughs> we got hit by this horrible storm on the way down. It snowed and it snowed and it snowed. Um, we'd run out of food now. We'd run out of fuel. Uh, there were sections of the climb which were horizontal, which took... Uh, basically, you were going about uh, 100 metres per hour. So to, to traverse 100 metres of terrain takes an hour, and it's exhausting. You're sinking up to your waist in this horrible sort of porridge-like consistent snow. And then, of course, when you get to the downhill sections, there's a huge amount of avalanche danger, and I don't know how we made it off that mountain alive, but we did. We got to above our advanced base site and discovered that the whole glacier had shifted sideways and wiped away the ropes we'd left behind. Luckily we had a couple of ropes with us, so we were able to um, do a very risky descent down to our advanced base camp site where we arrived utterly exhausted and totally out of food, really at the end of our tether. And I guess the upside is that, um, well, unfortunate for our families, but we've been reported missing. Uh, and that, that was sort of about two weeks because we, you know, we didn't have radios or anything like that. Um, it was bad for our family. It was really good for our notoriety, though. When we got back here, you know, a lot of people were interested in what we'd done and, you know, got a bit of media coverage and, and we were able to um, finally get our foot in the door at Channel 9 and convince Sam Chisholm 
to um, to back us for for our upcoming trip to Everest, which was, you know, in the end that uh, made us made it all possible. I was just pulling my trousers up when I heard a muffled roar somewhere, and I was sort of oh, yeah, another avalanche. Where is it? And I looked, oh my god, the whole of the horizon above me was exploding. This sort of mass of exploding snow. It was an avalanche. Um, that wasn't un unusual, but this avalanche was unusual in its size. And it took me, I suppose, a split second to realize that this avalanche was too big to be contained within the very generous confines of the big gully, which was over to the left of me. This huge thing called the Great Kuwa, which all the not, not avalanches normally got channeled down. I just had enough time to, to lunge for the rope when this avalanche came down, spilled out over the, the edge of the Great Kuwa and came down on top of us. I thought for sure I'm a goner. But after about a minute of being pummeled by the snow, having snow forced in every sort of crevice, orifice of my upper body, it stopped and I was still there. Shivering like a leaf, I basically had to get totally undressed because everything was caked in snow, coated in snow. When I regained my breath, I yelled out at Greg and to my great relief, I got a reply. This is beyond the physical. This is really, it's all about how much drive you have to, to make yourself go forward because Going 20 steps at this altitude, even though you're probably, you know, amongst the fittest people in the world, is a gargantuan effort. And you've got to force yourself to keep going. You haven't got the sort of psychological momentum built up over a long period of time where you, you know, back home, wherever you've been, you've been dreaming about going to this mountain. You've been dreaming about yourself performing well at that altitude, enjoying being there, looking at, you know, the view, everything. If you haven't put that time in beforehand, and it becomes very, very hard to get anywhere. And by two o'clock in the afternoon, we're only there. I say only there, we've still got a long way to go. And I'm looking at my watch, looking at the sun, the sun's just going like this. I'm thinking there's no way, but you know, we've just gotta keep going, we've just gotta keep going. And we decided we'd go till sunset. At this stage, five steps is all you can do before you're totally and utterly exhausted. And there, I mean, it's a simple trick, really. The simplest trick in the book, but it's, no matter what you're doing, it's equally valid. If you've got a big problem, break it down into manageable steps and just concentrate. As long as, if you just concentrate on that next step, that's all you have to do. The summit's up there in the back of your mind inspiring you, of course, to do the job, but that's not what you concentrate on. It's the next step. If you're careful, really anything is possible and it's worth having uh, dreams, no matter how silly they are, and some of them are even worth putting into practice. Might seem like a silly question, but uh, you mentioned that you're only up the top for 20 minutes, and you've spent all that time getting up there, all the hard effort. Um, did you feel like, you know, whatever breath you had left in, you're screaming out the top of your lungs, or doing a yodel lady you or something like that? Well, you know, tell you the truth, I was too much out of breath, but but um, that photo just doesn't do it justice. Not the the beauty of the scene. It was so beautiful. I was so overwhelmed that. Um, it was all I could do to say a few words and to take the recorder I had. Um, just a few simple words and um, um, it, was, uh, it was hard to believe that there we were because it's been such a, a, an uphill battle, so to speak. So uncertain, right until the last half hour, you know, we didn't know we were going to make it. And so to finally be there was um, um, unbelievable. and, and as I said, you, you're trying to keep this euphoria. And what I didn't mention is when that euphoria is, you know, you keep a good cap on it to survive. And it, it does actually, when you get off the mountain, you finally sort of go off the last ropes and onto the glass and I clipped my skis on. It was then that I, that this overwhelming sense of, um, I guess, well-being and uh, how beautiful the world was suddenly sort of started flowing in and, and um, it's an incredibly addictive feeling. It's like being, I guess, like being born again in some ways. You know, every, you look at everything with a new light. Everything seems beautiful. You go, get back to camp and you have a cup of tea, and it feels like the most miraculous drink in the whole world. And you think, my God, how could I ever have taken this so much for granted? Um, you know, climbing mountains not worth anything to anyone. I mean, but um, it's still, I think, inspiring because it's uh, every human being can relate to that. And, um, as part of our mythology to reach for the peak. And that can be extended to any you know, any field of endeavor. I don't I don't wanna
Um, it's actually detract from any of the messages that were in there that were all personalised to you, because I know everyone would have picked up sort of three or four or a half dozen sort of key points and thought, oh yeah, that's really applicable to me. But we're all going down this, this phase of business um, transformation and growth. And one of the things that resonated with me was that thing that you've got to be passionate about it. You've got to really like it and enjoy it. And if you, if you don't, then you're just not going to be able to achieve what you want to achieve. So that, for me, that really sort of resonated. And, and um, I know there are many messages that everyone is really sort of uh, pleased and honoured to be uh, here today listening to you. So thanks very much. Um, I appreciate your appreciation of New Zealand as well. Thank <laughs> you.